the central issue, the central theme is over worship. Who will we worship? We need to understand who the God of the Bible is. We need to understand definitely what the Bible says from Genesis to Revelation on who God is. Who is the one God of the Bible, the true God, the creator of all things? The, the, the Bible, I believe, is clear on who the one God of the Bible is. Now, in my experience and my understanding about uh, who God is, I, I had the default understanding that God was basically a trinity. It's something that uh, everybody knows is the truth. Growing up in a Christian home and in a Christian environment, I was always taught that God is a certain way. This is what the Bible teaches about who God is, that God is a trinity. And I'd never really looked at it in detail until someone had brought it to my attention and gave me a little book and I had to study it. And I, and I realized that there is something here I'd not seen before. I seen for the first time that God was an actual real father who had a real son. Having studied the book of Revelation to be able to present it verse by verse and chapter by chapter, I had to do so much study in the book of Revelation to be able to present it in those 30 hours. And while I was studying the book of Revelation, I came to an understanding that what was in my mind about who God is was not in the Bible. And what I saw in the Bible was not what was in my mind in regard to who God was. And so I had to take some serious um, looks at the scripture and come to a different understanding of who God is. Growing up in the church, I never really questioned the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, in turn, I never really took that doctrine and compared it with Scripture until recently. I was challenged to do this, and when I did, I was surprised at what I found. Uh, what I found was that we have a God, and He is the one true God, and that true God has a Son, and that Son is real. I realized that God is a Father of Jesus Christ. And the love of God just took on this, this amazing reality that just impacted my mind when I realized that God actually gave His real Son up. Like it says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That really impacted me in a way I never did before. And I realized that this relationship of Father and Son was a real relationship and that it's the foundation for all the other truths that we learn in the Scriptures. That was very life-changing for me. The Bible overwhelmingly and clearly states that God is, is the Father, that the one God is the Father, and this one God has a Son. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoso believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that to me was profound in that we have a Father that had a Son to give. Because if it says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, then He must have had a Son in order to be able to give that Son. And that Son was His only begotten Son. Many people today will say that God is a mystery. God is a mystery. And because God is a mystery, we should not really uh, try to understand or study and get into the fine details about who God is. A lot of people have said that God is a mystery and we shouldn't be really talking about who God is because we can't really understand Him. And I used to say that before more than I do now as a Trinitarian because the Trinity doctrine to me was actually very much bigger than my mind could handle because there was no biblical roots in it. Uh, for example, try to look up the word Trinity. It doesn't appear in the Bible. Now, one thing that was really shocking to me is that the word Trinity is not found anywhere in the Bible, nor is the term uh, God the Son or God the Holy Spirit, nor is God ever described as a, a unity of three co-eternal persons. Uh, in fact, co-eternal is not found in the Bible. Co-eternal persons is not found in the Bible. And so there's all these phrases that are commonly used that we don't find in, in the scriptures. So if you're gonna study the Trinity, that'd be a good place to start, right? So when you, when you then study about who God is, God the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is my beloved Son, that when you start realizing those phrases are in the Bible and you start looking at those, then you can start piece, piecing things together. And I started seeing verses all throughout the scripture differently. 
there was a period there where it was it, my mind was almost confused and, and whether this is right or whether this is wrong and what does this mean and what does that mean but all of a sudden as I continued to study I something clicked and it just made perfect sense there was this clarity that I had never seen before and the scriptures just opened up in a beautiful new way. Uh, there are a number of verses that really, really stood out to me. Uh, foremost among them is what Jesus said in John 17, 3. He says that this is, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. He was praying to his Father. His Father is the only true God. And knowing him and knowing the Son is what eternal life is all about. It's not about, you know, ideas and doctrines and, and concepts. They are good and they have their place, but we're not saved based on that. We're saved based on this knowledge. It's a saving knowledge of a person, the father, and another person, his son. One thing that really hit me the hardest when studying this topic was when I read again for the first time 1 John 2, 22, and it reads like this. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So some of the verses that I remember reading that were standing out as so different than what I had believed before, much of what is not in the Bible, like for example, the Holy Spirit having a throne, the Bible never says that. But I remember going through the Revelation and looking at chapter 22 and verse 1. And when it says there, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So the throne has the, the Father there and the Lamb, which is the Son or Jesus Christ. But the river of water that comes from that throne, the water of life, that's specifically referring to the Holy Spirit. The Bible revelation of the oneness of God, and, and when we say oneness, we mean one as in one, one number, solitary one. Uh, the clearest verse comes from the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6.4. In Deuteronomy 6.4, Israel was told, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then uh, it follows with uh, the relationship that they were to have with God. Now, the word they're used for uh, one is echad, the Hebrew for echad. And a lot of people assume that that means a unit or, or some kind of a committee, that God is a unity. And in that one unity, there are actually more than one person that composed the one God of the Bible. Uh, that is not the case at all. That's not how the Jews understood it and it's not how uh, the New Testament reveals it. We know that because we find that the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, versed in the Old Testament scriptures, who became a Christian and a believer. And under inspiration, he is writing to the church in Corinth and he reminds them of a very significant truth, this particular truth, and he reveals his understanding of Deuteronomy 6.4 and who that is talking about, the one God. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6, he says, but to us there is but one God. He says, but unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we of Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by Him. Specifically, it says the one God of the Bible is the Father. He's the source of all things, of whom are all things. So there is one God, that is the Father, and one Lord, which is His Son, Jesus Christ. So the one God in particular is clearly the Father. So according to Paul, Deuteronomy 6.4 that's talking about the one God of Israel is really referring to the Father. He says, to us there is but one God and then he names that, it's the Father. That's the title, of course, that's not a proper name. His name is Jehovah. That's mentioned in Deuteronomy 6. Uh, you know, Jehovah, our God, is one Jehovah. That's the name of God the Father the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one God of the Bible, the one God of Scripture, the one God of the universe, the one God of all creation. Who is this Creator? This Creator is none other but the Father. He is the Creator. The Father is the Creator. Malachi chapter 2 verse 10 says, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us all? And so the one God the Creator is the Father. Now we know that He created through His Son, Jesus Christ. You have Ephesians chapter 4, it says we have, there's one body, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one Spirit, there's one Lord, and there's one God, the Father of all, above all and in you all. So again, Paul specifically says the one God of the Bible is the Father of all. He's God the Father. 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You know, the, the culmination of our faith is, as, as he progresses here in these steps, is that there is one God. And then he tells us this one God is the Father. The Father, God is the Father, and he is above all. Now, would that include Jesus Christ? Is the Father above Jesus Christ? Well, it stands to reason that if he is above all, every single thing, that he is the ultimate authority, even above Jesus Christ, even above the Son, even above the Spirit. And so that verse right there really challenges the idea or the concept that we have concerning the Trinity. Now you may say, well, uh, yeah, in a sense, there is a hierarchy and the Father is above all in, in a sense, but not in an absolute sense. Well, I want to give you another verse. There's another verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 28 says, When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And so right there it says the, the Son also will be subject to the Father. So the Father is the ultimate authority of the universe because he is the source of all things, or all things have come from him, including his very own son. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, I believe it is, uh, where it says we have one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So the one God is obviously not Jesus Christ, it is the Father of Jesus Christ, he's God the Father. One God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And this was the consistent testimony of both the Old and the New Testament. So it's the same identity, the same one God, it doesn't change. Um, there's James chapter 2 verse 19 also. It says, Thou believe it that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Again, in, in Romans also, Romans chapter 3 verse uh, 30, it says, Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. So again, it says there is one God. And Paul is the author of Corinthians and Ephesians where, and, and Timothy where we saw, he said this one God is the, is the Father. Uh, and uh, this is very, very clearly brought out also in the book of Acts uh, chapter 3 uh, and verse 13 when uh, Peter was speaking and he identifies in one verse the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Fathers, which is consistent with, of course, what we see in the New Testament as well. In Acts 3, and verse 13, here is Peter preaching under inspiration. This is what he says. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of the entire Old Testament, the God of the fathers is one God. And according to Peter, this is the father. He has a son. This one God has a son whose name is Jesus and he glorified his son Jesus. Also in the conversation between Jesus and, and the scribe in Mark chapter 12, they both agree that there is one God, uh, the greatest of all the commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And, and uh, in their correspondence, uh, Jesus did not correct the scribe to tell him that this one God is made of three. Obviously, Jesus was referring to his father. So the Bible is very clear that there is one God and this one God is the father. It's often said that God is a plurality of persons and thus a trinity because of Genesis 1.26 where it says, let us make man in our image. God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Many people will point to that and say, look right there, you have a plurality of persons. God is saying us. That means God is more than one person. Why would God say us? Well, the answer is really very simple because when God is saying, let us, it means he was speaking to someone else. The one God of the Bible, God the Father, was actually addressing someone else. And in addressing this other person, he says, let us work together in this creation. Let us do this together. Let us make man in our image. The question is, who was he talking to? You have to search the scriptures to see who is the express image of God because he said, let us make man in our image image. So they obviously go, whoever God was speaking to, they shared the same image. 
And as far as the Bible reveals, it reveals only one other being who is the express image of God, and that is His Son, Jesus Christ. In John 1, uh, the first few verses of uh, the Gospel of John, it tells us that all things were made by the Word or by Christ. God was actually speaking to His Son when He said, let us. How do we understand Genesis 1, 26? Very easy. That God said, that is the Father said, let us, let us, my dear Son, you and me, let us make man in our image. We get some insight into this when we read on page 145 of a book called Early Writings. And God is actually quoted again here, but it says, but when God said to his son, let us make man in our image, it says Satan was jealous of Jesus. So what we're shown here is that the us is the father and the son, not a trinity of gods. It's the father and the son. It's the father saying to the son, let us make man in our image. So I believe that God was speaking to his son saying, let us make man in our image. God had only one image and that is his son, Jesus. If you are to believe otherwise, we need scriptural evidence to prove that there is a third being who is the express image of God. When God created man, he created two individuals, a man and then a woman. Two were created in the image and likeness of God. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So first there was the creation of Adam, and then there was the bringing forth of Eve. So what's amazing is, when we see the story, after God created man in his own image, that included Adam and Eve. That's two not three. And now what's fascinating is in Genesis 2 verse 7 when it says that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So we have this form of Adam that had the spirit or the breath of God breathed into him. And so the spirit of God, the breath of God was in all the fullness of humanity. So Eve, when she was brought forth from Adam, she was of the same substance, and in her as well, was all the fullness of humanity. But the Spirit of God was also in her, which was in all the fullness of humanity. So you have Adam and Eve, and in them was the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God was in all the fullness of humanity. We can see also in a, in a series of books, the uh, booklets years back called Bible Training School, that God is all the fullness of the Godhead. The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead. And then later in the next paragraph, the Comforter who Christ promised to send after his ascension is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead. So you have the Father and the Son bringing forth Adam and Eve. And in the Father and the Son is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead. In Adam and Eve is the Spirit of God in all the fullness of humanity. So you're actually seeing a very similar thing in this real life illustration of Adam and Eve. And a lot of people say, well, what about the Hebrew word Elohim? That's a plural word for God. That's an indicator that God must be more than one person. That's not the case because if you look up the meaning of the word Elohim, even though it is a plural word, when used of the true God of the Bible, the dictionary describes it as uh, plural intensive with singular meaning. In other words, the Hebrews use this word to denote God's greatness and majesty rather than a plurality within God. We find this word applied to uh, even pagan false gods, which were only individual gods. There weren't a plurality of gods. They were not a trinity. They were not a three in one God. So the word Elohim does not have uh, a numerical hint that God is more than one. It denotes greatness. It denotes majesty. If we're going to take the word Elohim and then conclude that God is a plurality of persons, then we're going to have some problems. Because if you turn to Exodus 7, 1 and read about what God says to Moses, he says, you will be Elohim to Pharaoh. God says to Moses, Behold, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron shall be thy prophet. And the word used there for God 
is actually Elohim. In other words, God says I, to Moses, I have made you Elohim to Pharaoh. Now, does that mean that God made Moses into more than one person? Well, how many Moses do we have? Just one. So, Elohim cannot mean a plurality of persons. Um, Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, is said to be an Elohim city. Well, how many cities were there? Just one city. In Exodus 11 and verse 3, you notice how it's described. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of, e of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servant, and in the sight of the people. That's the word Elohim. When applied to a single person, that's what it means. It denotes greatness and majesty. Rather than it being a plurality of God or a plurality of beings or persons, it's plurality of majesty. It's to emphasize the majesty of God. It's to emphasize the majesty of Moses in the sight of Pharaoh. And it's to emphasize the, uh, the city of Nineveh uh, being a majestic city. A lot of people will say that in Genesis 126, you have Elohim, which is mentioned, and that's a plural word. I agree that's right. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, where it talks about um, thy God or the Lord thy God is one Lord. The Lord is a singular word. The Lord our God, which is a plural word, is one Lord. What the Israelites were trying to say in that verse, which is the Shema that they refer to much these days even, they're saying that this singular Lord is, though his name is plural, he's one Lord. Mm -hmm. Moses, of course, in Exodus chapter 32, when he's referring to the apostasy at the base of the mountain where Moses was up in Mount Sinai, they're talking about a um, Aaron who, when he says that he received all of their jewelry and then graved it with a graving tool, it says in verse 4, he made it a molten calf. Now notice, he made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And so the one golden calf ended up being Elohim. Uh, Aaron said, These be thy gods. These be thy Elohim, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. So Elohim, now remember, that was only one calf. There, there was only one calf there. Which they called gods, but how many was that? There's only one, right? So there's one calf called gods, and Moses, a one person, was called gods, or God, plural, Elohim. So Elohim can have a singular meaning. Yes, although it is a plural word, it can definitely, most assuredly, refer to a single uh, individual or a single thing or a single false god, as it's used sometimes, or a single person like Moses, or a single golden calf. So people will use Genesis 1 uh, verse 2 and show that there's God who created through his Son, and then the Spirit of God being there means that there was God the Spirit. And so you have, in the eyes of many people today, and even in my own not too many years back, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit were all included in creation. Now I understand that differently, in that the Bible says that uh, the Father who commanded the light to shine forth out of darkness has shined in our hearts through the, through the face of Jesus Christ. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And what we're seeing, what I'm noticing now is in Genesis 1 verse 2, it's the Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the waters. It's not God the Spirit. Very big difference. Another verse that people really misunderstand is in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah is, he sees a vision of God sitting upon the throne. I believe it's, it's the Father. He sees the Father sitting upon the throne and a coal uh, comes and touches his lips. And then the words are spoken. I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. And so people will look at that and say, well, there you go. The Lord said, who will go for us? Who will go for us? We do have the Father and His Son. And so there is, as we see in creation, let us make man in our image. In the same way, 
a person can easily understand who will go for us as who will go for the Father and who will go for the Son. Who will go for the Father and the Son? Who will go for us? The baptism of Christ is one of the stories or one of the incidents that a lot of people see that God must be revealing Himself as three separate persons. You have God the Father in heaven, you have the Son of God being baptized in the water, and you have the Spirit, which a lot of people assume is God the Holy Spirit, right there between heaven and earth. And people say, this is a very clear picture of the Trinity. At the baptism of Jesus, we clearly see that there are three. There's a Father, there's a Son, and there is a Holy Spirit. There's a Holy Spirit. And I understand why people will look at that and they'll say, you know, look, right there, God is a Trinity. God is three. There's three of them, that the Holy Spirit is, is God, the Son is God, and, and the Father is God. And we see all three of them, they're separate yet they're all God, so there's a trinity right there. And I understand, I used to believe that way, I used to think that way. I believe it's reading into the scriptures what is not there. Yes, there is a Father, there is a Spirit, and there is Jesus. But if you are to read and believe what it says, in all the accounts of the Gospels, uh, it says the Holy Spirit, or Matthew says, it is the Spirit of God descending like a dove. That's in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. So all what we see, if you are to read and believe what the scripture says, is that God spoke from heaven and the Spirit of God or the life of God, the Spirit of God, the, 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 the presence of God came into Jesus, His Son. Let's read the passage uh, from the Gospel of Matthew and see what we can learn. Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 16. And Jesus, when He was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto Him, and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon Him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Father indicated His relationship to His Son. He says, This is my beloved Son. And it was the Spirit of God, not a different person to God, but God's own Spirit that came upon Christ in the shape of a dove. It was the light and glory and majesty of God that came down upon Christ and glorified Him, gave Him this uh, halo of light, so to speak, and that descent was like a dove to indicate the position and the mission of Christ. Isaiah chapter 11, chapter 11 and verse 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. Um, and Isaiah 42 also, it says, Behold my servant whom I uphold whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. And we also have Isaiah chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So over and over again, we see that the Bible prophesied that the spirit of God or the life of God will be upon his son Jesus. And we see that taking place in his baptism. At the baptism, the Spirit of the Father came upon Jesus Christ. And we see that because in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach and to teach and to heal and all those things. So Jesus Christ said, The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father is upon me. So if we are to just read and believe what the Scripture says, we have to take it as it reads. It's a spirit. It's the life of God. It's not a, a, a different person than God himself. It's often assumed that at the baptism of Jesus, you see all three members of the Trinity present in one place at one time. But if we look at an article that was written in 1874 in the Youth Instructor, uh, we read something that actually gives us insight into that event never had angels listened to such a prayer. They were solicitous to bear to the praying Redeemer messages of assurance and love. But no, the Father Himself would minister to His Son. Direct from the throne proceeded the light and the glory of God. The heavens were opened and beams of light and glory proceeded therefrom and assumed the form of a dove in appearance like burnished gold. The dove-like form was emblematical of the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So you see here, the, the dove-like form was an emblem 
The dove-like form was not a third being. And the Father himself was the one who came and ministered to the Son, not someone other than the Father. Now, I want to share another passage that sheds light on the story of the baptism and, and shows us who was responsible for the voice and for the shape of the dove that descended upon Christ. Uh, we read it in John chapter 5 and verse 37. Jesus speaking to the unbelieving Jews, he says, And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. What event was Jesus referring to where the Father spoke with a voice and there was a shape. He was referring to the baptism. Jesus says that the one who was responsible for the voice and the shape is God the Father. So the voice was God the Father's and the shape was from God the Father. It was the Spirit of God. We can't assume or deduce that it is someone else who was brought into the picture besides God the Father. God the Father was giving a dual witness of His Son, one that was heard and one that was seen. He sent His Spirit and He spoke with His voice. That's a confirmation of that relationship that Christ holds to His Father. He is His only begotten and beloved Son. Matthew 28 verse 18 to 20, we have the baptismal formula there, um, or the commission, the Great Commission, and many believe that this is a, a, an evidence, a great evidence for a trinity because it says, uh, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, it is true, as we mentioned over and over again, there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Holy Spirit. Uh, the passage, as a matter of fact, the whole chapter does not mention the word God. It's not dealing with who God is. Jesus was not explaining or telling us the identity of who God is. He was simply giving a commission and it mentions name in the name singular. Now you have one name and within that name you have the Father, the Son and the Spirit. Now how, do, how are we supposed to understand that? Well we let the Bible, if we let the Bible interpret itself, we see clearly in the book of Acts how the disciples understood their Lord and their Master Jesus Christ. They went out and they baptized and they commanded people to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ and in the name of the Lord or in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why if you look in the book of Acts, you will see that all the baptisms uh, happened in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Lord. That's Acts chapter 2, 38, 10, 48, 8, 16 and 19, 5. They all happened in the name of Jesus. So either the apostles misunderstood what Jesus said and they were baptizing people in the wrong name or we today have, we have misunderstood what Jesus meant and are taking it uh, uh, to a level that Jesus did not uh, mean to take it. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, because God is love. That God is love, and love needs others in order to exist. Therefore, God must be more than one person, because God is love. And it sounds nice, uh, and it it's, it's sounds good, uh, yet it's, it's not true. It's, it's not based upon the Bible, because in the very next verse, verse 9, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, it says, In this uh, was the love of God manifested, that He sent His Son. And so how is the love of God shown to us? John 3, 16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And so... Right there, God is love. How did God prove His love? By giving His Son. And so the very God of love is the Father, is the Father. And so we don't need to read into, any, into the text anything that is not there. We need to look at the context and the surrounding verses. And we find that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, verse 9, that yes, God is love. And that love was manifested and given to us in the person of His Son. He actually had a Son and he gave that real son, his only begotten son. He never had any other son like him. Christ is in this category all by himself. And God the Father loved the world. And, you know, we need to personalize that. He loved me so much that he gave up that only begotten son. The Bible describes Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Uh, we need to use that term instead of God the Son. We need to use that term and stick with the, what the Bible says and what the Bible describes. because. Inevitably, there, there, there is an inherent danger in that, in, in the sense that once I say something like, well, Jesus Christ is God the Son, a term that is not found in the Bible, or that God is a trinity, once we go down that path, 
you are now substituting what I believe to be man's words in the place of God's words. And many, many groups, many churches will make that a test of fellowship. And that's the natural progression, that if you do not believe uh, of these, in these words that I have described God as, as a trinity, as God the Son, God the Spirit, that you are now a, a heretic, you do not belong in our group because you do not subscribe to these certain phrases, which ironically enough are man-made. 